and I'm very happy that you can be here. And there have been a lot of studies done on Zoom and actually uh, that there is a wonderful group dynamic that happens when people gather together like this in person or over a computer screen. So I'm hoping everybody can feel the warmth of the community that we have here. And um, I'm feeling it, it, it feels great. So that being said, um, if you can just take a minute and kind of settle into your seat, into your couch on, on the floor, wherever you are, get a sense of your body settling in and being comfortable. And maybe get a sense of anything that feels tense. I tend to hold my shoulders up a little bit if I'm tense. So just take a, take a glance inwardly at your body and feel any areas of tension and just try to release those. Could be in your neck, your shoulders, whatever. Feel free to just move around a little bit and get comfortable. And then I invite you to take a deep breath in and then release your breath. Just relax. There's no place to go. There's nothing to do, but just be here in this moment. So taking a deep breath in and releasing it, you have actually just performed one of the most important parts of resilience. We'll talk about that later, but what you've done is, is you actually have relaxed the sympathetic nerve, which takes us to fight or flight, and it's often overused. And we have tapped into the parasympathetic nerve, which is the relax and recovery response. So just with that one breath, you've taken your body, your body-mind connection to that rest and recovery response. So now I'm going to, I'm just going to invite everybody to stretch and release any tension that might be still remaining. And I want to read you a quote from Rick Hansen, who's written the book, which is really the primary source of my um, education and resilience experience too, but he's done so much research. He's, he's a um, psychologist, and uh, I'm just going to read who he is because this is important. He's a senior fellow of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley and a New York Times bestselling author. And uh, he's done so much research and has so many good um, tools and techniques and a really wonderful way of explaining things um, that I, I recommend this to anybody who'd like to do a little further research on their own or, or get some, just have it on hand as a resource. So he says, uh, true well-being or true resilience fosters well-being and an underlying sense of happiness, love, and peace. And when I read that, I thought, man, that must be an overstatement. How can something foster a sense of happiness, well-being, and peace? But as I started to connect the dots with my own practice of resilience, and that of working with clients uh, in groups, I realized that it's very, very true. This is a, a resource that we have, and once we develop it, it's a resource for life. And it's right here. It's not something you have to get on the phone for or um, 
tap into it another way. It's right here. And the more we practice it, the more it's going to get hardwired. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, so I just want to, I just want to share one experience that I had with you. Um, years ago, a, a good friend invited me to go to a silent retreat. I was just getting into meditation and she said, oh, this would be great for you and so on. And I thought, okay, good experience. And I went and I was surprised by my reaction. I looked out at, I don't know, maybe 50, 75 people. And they all looked like they knew exactly what they were doing. I thought, oh, they've got exactly the right meditation clothes on. They're sitting in just the right posture. And what am I doing here? That's a place that a lot of us sometimes go, which actually detracts from our resilience. So I had the awareness that I was feeling very uncomfortable and very much of an outsider. And as I sat there, a little voice came in and it said, sit in your goodness. I was surprised. I said, I must have some goodness someplace and I'll try to sit in it if that's all I have to do. So I tried to follow that. And every time I started veering off and saying, I don't know what I'm doing, I would just come back to that voice and say, okay, just sit in your goodness. And I enjoyed the rest of the weekend very much. And it helped me to not be an outsider um, and to tap into something deep inside of myself that I don't often tap into. So it's, it's called your wholeness. Every part of you, the parts you don't like, the parts you do like, the neutral parts. And I, I'd like you to envision a circle. Some of you have, who have come to the self-compassion group will remember this maybe, but a circle, three, three circles, one outer, another on the inside, and then another way on the inside. The outer circle is what we want the world to see. And the next spring is what we don't want the world to see. And the inner, inner circle is our core. And I like to call that, and philosophers and spiritual leaders have been calling that your core of goodness um, or your highest self, or some say the seat of your soul. But it is who we really are when we're not worried about what other people want us to be. So... We're going to be talking about that core of goodness because it is part of resiliency. Um, and that, that leads me into um, one of the first key components of resiliency, which is self-compassion. You might ask, what does that have to do with resiliency? Well, self-compassion is actually being as compassionate to yourself as you would to a very dear friend or a loved one. So uh, what does that mean? Well, when somebody's in trouble or calls up and says, I need you, uh, your first response is probably a very kind one. It's a listening response. It's not a jumping to conclusions or, oh, you should do this or you should do that. It's a listening, a deep listening. And so self-compassion is being there for yourself in the same way. So how does that connect with resiliency? Well, if you know that you can trust yourself, that you can trust being there for yourself, listening to yourself, and honoring your feelings, no matter what they are, then you have a rock to stand on. It's your own rock and it's with you 24 seven every day. 
So I really want to um, invite everybody to sit in your goodness. <laughs> and however that relates to you, to sit in your goodness. And for some of you, this material may just be a reminder or perhaps just something interesting, or for others that might be a window into possibly strengthening that inner core to getting it, know, knowing it better. Um, and also from giving us an awareness of that inner critic that can wanna pop in and say, you really can't do this. You've never done this before. What makes you think you can do this? Or this problem is way too big for you. Or this loss is something you'll never get over. Those are all things that an inner critic wants to pop in here. So um, I'm going to ask everybody just for a moment, if you have a pencil handy, great. If not, just in your own mind's eye. A list, making a list of what your inner goodness is. Is it being there for somebody else? Is it reacting in kindness? Is it being a good listener? Is it dropping everything and, and knowing that you're there for people who need you? Um, is it being kind to yourself? So just for a moment, I'm going to back out here. And if you could just bring those strengths, gifts, whatever you want to call them, to the forefront of who you are. Because those strengths are part of what help you say, I can do this. I got this. We can get through this. It's an attitude and it's a feeling. And it, what, it's what restores our sense of balance is knowing we're there for ourselves, first of all. So there's a lot of good news coming in here through amazing breakthrough technology that's happening in neuroscience, psychology, neurobiologists, everybody's talking about it. And it's called neuroplasticity. And you may have heard of it. It's being bantered about a lot. But very basically, neuroplasticity is our ability to restructure our brains, to actually build more neuronal pathways, to add um, positive input. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but. Um, the, the quote about neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to form and reorganize synaptic connections, those connections between the neurons that allowed for um, communication between the neurons, um, especially in response to learning or experience or following an injury. So the ability of neural networks in the brain to change through growth and reorganization. So you might say to yourself, oh, I've been doing it this way for 30 years or 10 years and I can't change. Um, I can't really develop resilience. Well, the good news is you can. And I've seen it in my own life. I have fallen down on the ground and just thought I'd never get up in a couple of situations. And 
So some of the tools we're going to talk about today, and we can't do them all, but uh, again, I refer to Rick Hansen's, Dr. Rick Hansen's book. So um, we're going to talk about a, a little bit of how do we remap our brains? Because our brains are programmed since pre-dawn to um, go to the negative bias, and that's for survival. Okay, so if we're walking as uh, cave people and we're walking past a bunch of bushes and something rattles, our brain has to say, oh my God, that may be a tiger and we go into fight or flight. So fight or flight is exactly that or freeze. So everything in our body, our physiological body starts to change. Our heart rate increases. We start shooting out cortisol and um, our, our blood flow increases and everything physiological, so many physiological hormones start shooting out to make us be able to run or fight or freeze. And that's okay uh, if it's a real danger, but sometimes mismanaging your checkbook or somebody calling with an angry message or a boss saying you're late for your um, your your date for your uh, review or whatever, or you you haven't turned in the the work you wanted we wanted you to. That type of thing can also make us go into fight or flight. And guess what? We've been in fight or flight for over two years now. This virus has put us all on high alert. Have I touched a doorknob I shouldn't have touched? Is somebody at the grocery store too close to me? Am I going to bring this home to people I love? And on and on and on. I don't want to re-traumatize anybody here, but that's what I'm getting at. We have been in chronic fight or flight. And so I'd love to hear from you. And I'm, I'd like to start with um, Anne, who has set up this program and who has been one of the most resilient people I know. She's, the library has had to stay open. She's one of those uh, people who have had to be here no matter what, welcoming people and making programs happen. So I'm just curious, Anne, if you could start us off and let us know how, what's, how has your resilience been and what are some of the things that may have helped you or hindered it? Sure, like everything else, there's um, highs and lows and circles and spirals and some days you feel really good and other days you don't feel so good. But I've been um, consciously developing a toolbox over the last year, I had a big birthday and I've looked for ways to strengthen and, um, group meetings. I am a pretty regular attendee of my own church. I also attend online meetings of Al-Anon. Um, so being together with like-minded people to kind of, you know, yeah, you're okay type things. Um, I think walking in nature is one of my biggest resilience because you just realize how small we really are and how as big as our individual problems seem. Um, when you go out in nature, it's, you know, consider the lilies of the field, everything, everything always works out okay. So those are my two biggest. Uh, and I've started recently to start moving my body a little bit more and coming back into the breath. You had talked about the breath. And uh, as I've restarted a yoga practice, the teacher online has said, it always starts with the breath. So when I have start feeling tensing up, I, I actually have an app on my watch <laughs> that I can actually time myself breathing and it just kind of That's brings cool. me back into myself. Um, so basically I'll do whatever I can. <laughs> but sometimes there are times where, you know, you have to lay on the floor and cry and I allow myself to do that as well. Yeah, good point. good point. Anybody else with a show of hands would like to speak to what may have helped them stay in balance or come back into balance or uh, be resilient during this? trial that we've been under uh, from Nina. 
Uh, what's the name of that app? She wants to know the name of the app that Nina wants to know the name of your app. The app, I, my daughter gave me a wonderful um, watch. I got that Apple watch. <laughs> so in my Apple watch, there's actually a, a thing where it, you hit it and it breathes and it has you breathe in and breathe out. So it came with a watch. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? Do I see any hands yeah. here? If anybody who would like to share, it's fine if you don't want to because we're, um, but I, I am sure that you've all had some wonderful ways of coming back to your resilience or building on it and maybe helping other people. So um, I can is, say something. Yeah. I, I, I can say some. I've been, um, it's been really helpful to go on nature walks, um, very similar. And I've been doing a sketching practice in the morning and my, and my nature walks and some meditation. And that's always really started me off in the right way. It's just been so cold lately, so I haven't done it. <laughs> yeah, but um, I miss it. But that really helps me as well. Yeah, thank you. When you say sketching, that's is that like a meditation for you, or is it? It's something that relaxes me enough to be able to meditate. So I'll sketch okay. first and then meditate. Yeah. Yeah. So everything that's been mentioned and some of the other things that you might be thinking about are a way of changing the track. You know, when a train's going down a track and it's like horrible, awful, terrible going down that track. And then you say, oh, I'm gonna go up, get out into nature for a little while. Or I'm gonna pick up the phone and call a friend. I'm gonna do some deep breathing. That's allowing the track to divert and it's allowing a space for you to get away from that it's not it's not saying i'm not going to deal with it but it's allowing your brain to go into that recovery mode which we need so much so what does this uh brain neuroplasticity have to do with resilience? Well, it's actually telling us we have more control than we thought we did in our responses to things. Uh, and how is that so? Well, we have a, a parasympathetic nerve and we have a sympathetic nerve. I'll try to explain this as easily as I can. But basically, the Sympathetic is the one that says, oh, oh, there's a tiger in the bush, or oh, oh, I overdo my checking account. Um, so I, I'm going into fight or flight automatically. When we have some tools, we can be aware, and awareness is probably the first tool I should have mentioned, but when we have those tools, we can be aware of, oops, I am going into fight or flight. And that may be necessary if, if you're on a dark street and you see somebody following you, yeah, go into fight, flight by all means. But if it's a situation where um, somebody's aggravated you or you've gotten into a, a, a tough situation at work or whatever, going into fight or flight isn't gonna really help because what it does is it shuts down the part of the brain that's a a great creative part, it's a problem solver. So we shut that down when we go into fight or flight. So what we wanna do is have both parts accessible, okay? And we do that with our tools. So knowing about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, we also know that there's a, a vagus nerve that goes from the stem of our brain all the way down to our gut. Why is that important? Well, that's the communication system between your mind and your body, basically. And what scientists, neurobiologists have found is that the communication is 80% from your gut to your brain and 20% from your brain to your gut. We've always thought that was the reverse. So um, what that tells you also is that 
when we're able to slow things down, create that space, we're able to make choices about, do I want to go into fight or flight, or do I want to go into rest and relax? Rick Hansen compares these two uh, parts of the autonomic, autonomic nervous system to the brake and the pedal. So the pedal would be like, yeah, let's go full force into fight or flight or freeze or whatever. And the brake is the parasympathetic that says, let's slow down, let's rest in response uh, and relax a little bit before we go into full gear here. And what that does, just that very simple pause, even with one breath, it gives you the ability to really tap into your creative problem solving and to see the bigger picture. It's very easy to lose track of the big picture. So um, there's a couple of ways of doing that. One I'm gonna show you right now is if you wanna try it out, put one hand on your forehead and the other hand on the back of your neck. It's a way that science has found of, of reconnecting the left brain and the right brain. Just take a deep breath in as you're doing it and release it. You can give a nice heavy exhale. So the exhale they have found is what puts us into rest and relax. So if you can take an inhale and a long exhale, even make a noise while you're doing it, you're automatically releasing that sympathetic nerve and saying to the parasympathetic, okay, we're here. We know you're here. We, we need you. So... We have a lot more control than we thought we did. And there are so many practices we can do. Uh, EFT tapping is one of them. And I can tell you that just even what they call the karate chop, taking one hand and patting it underneath your pinky finger, they have found that this can be one of the most relaxing, responsive things you can do. If you're anxious, you've gotten bad news, uh, you're dealing with a health problem, whatever, I can do it under the table in a meeting and nobody knows I'm doing that. If somebody's getting my goat, if I start tapping, it's amazing. The other key point is right on your collarbone. So try it. You can even think of something that's bothered you Bring it to mind and tap on your collarbone all around. This is a meridian. It relaxes that meridian and opens. What we're trying to do is keep the flow open because when we're tense, when we're worried, when we're frightened, everything tightens up. Okay? You can feel your facial muscle, muscles tightening, maybe your heart. You can feel your chest tightening. And that cuts down the blood flow to your brain, to every part of your body when we need it. So uh, tapping, doing this. The other thing is figure eights. I'm not gonna stand up and do this, but you can. Um, so you can clasp your hands together and do a big figure eight. This is a wonderful way to relax, and get your two sides of your brain working together. I like to think of the figure eight because it's the sign of infinity. And there's a wonderful book called The Power of Eight about people getting together, setting an intention and the, the results of these experiments of Power of Eight have been amazing. But anyway, um, so those are, those are a few tools for releasing and relaxing. 
And if you can only remember the breathing part of it, I tend to be a shallow breather. Uh, I think that's probably from childhood uh, response to things that were uncomfortable or maybe not being heard or whatever. So I tend to be a shallow breather and I work every day to bring my awareness to that and to say like, well, like what Ann said, maybe a couple times a day to say, where am I with my breathing? And I'd be doing more breaths. So we've looked at a couple of those tools. Uh, I would encourage you to look up neuroplasticity on the website, do a little reading, learn about, um, you know, it, it behooves us to know how our systems work, how our brain is interacting with the rest of us, and to also um, be mindful of where we feel things in our body. Because our body is the first alarm system of something's off or maybe something's wonderful. You can get tingles in your fingers or goosebumps when something wonderful has happened. You can also start being aware of where am I holding that tension in my body and how can I release it? Anne mentioned a couple of things, yoga, Michelle said sketching, being in nature. So those are all um, ways of releasing that tension. And that's what we want to do as, as many times a day as we can. I said also picking up the phone. That's part of self-compassion. I sometimes put my, my hand on my heart. And I say, I'm here for you. What do you need right now? Sometimes my heart says, you need some water. You haven't been drinking. Or you need to relax. Or you need to say no. How about that one? How many of us have just been, yeah, I'll do that, whatever. If you need me, I'm there. But meanwhile, your battery's being drained and you don't even realize it. So when you need your resilience, it's drained out. I, I liken it to a bank account, really. If we keep taking out from the bank, there's nothing left when you need it for an emergency. So resilience is the same way. We have to build on it. Um, we don't have to, but it's a good idea. Um, so we build on it. And so we know that in, in good times, it's there, but it's also there in times that are stressful or traumatic even. It's, um, it's a built-in resource. That's your inner resource. So your outer resources, what, what could some of your outer resources be? Um, people have already mentioned them. You know, nature, picking up the phone and calling a friend. Um, and mentioned sitting on the floor and crying, or my favorite place to cry is in the shower. <laughs> um, but so being mindful of how you're feeling, maybe getting more in touch with your feelings, uh, getting to know yourself and become your best friend. So uh, just what I wanna touch uh, very briefly, we've talked about uh, self-compassion. I wanna talk about internalizing positive experiences. And Rick Hansen uh, brings out lots of research on how this changes the brain neurology for the better. So what do we mean by internalizing positive experiences? So we go through the day and we probably have 50 positive experiences, maybe little, maybe some bigger, but one negative experience is what's going to reside with us because our brains are programmed for that negative bias. And I can't go into all of that right now. There's a lot of uh, lot written about that, but just trust me, we have a negative bias. And if we go through 50 things, we may likely remember the negative. So internalizing the positive is becoming more mindful of the things that bring you joy or comfort during the day. 
It can be something small like the smell of coffee. It can be um, a phone call from a friend that you haven't heard from in a long time. For me, one of the things was seeing somebody smile across the street after seeing so many masks and just eyes. Seeing a real smile, it was like, wow. That was like sunshine coming through. So little things like that, a hot shower. Um, and I'm going to tell you something funny. John Kabat-Zinn, who was the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction up in Massachusetts, a world-renowned uh, speaker and healer and researcher. And he said something funny one day. He said, so when you take a shower, who's in the shower with you? What's in the shower with you? And I thought, that's a strange thing to ask. And then he said, are you thinking about where you need to go in an hour? Are you thinking about what you haven't got done? Are you thinking about an angry conversation you had with somebody? And you could go on and on. I, I don't need to list all of them. But so next time you're in the shower, think about, are you there being mindful of how good that shower feels? Or is your mind off into the rest of the day or yesterday even? That's part of resilience is feeling the warmth of the shower. What is it doing for me? Well, actually, it's relaxing my heart. Actually, it's relaxing the tension in my back and thinking about what it's doing for you and even being grateful for the warmth of the shower and that we have hot water. Um, so there, there are a couple stages in internalizing positive uh, experiences. And one of them is experiencing what we want to grow. So what do we mean by that? So if I want to grow a closer relationship with somebody, um, I'm going to try to make some experiences that make that happen. Maybe getting together for a walk if we can't be together in person right now, uh, close, you know, in a restaurant or whatever. Going out for a walk in nature and making sure that I keep that connection somehow or picking up the phone and saying, hey, I miss you. Um, and growing that experience of personal, interpersonal connection. Because it's something that's been very hard to keep going during this pandemic, I think for many of us. So we have to go the extra mile. We have to be a little innovative in how we do that. Um, so basically, we want to feel loved. We want to feel confident. We want to feel grateful. And all of that is um, experiencing the positive. And so we're not just going to think, oh, yeah, that good thing happened. We're going to take a moment and we're going to feel it. Where did I feel that? phone call, that love, loved person calling me? Where did I feel that in my body? Did my heart feel warmer? Did my overall body relax more just hearing that voice? Um, that's what wires it, what hardwires it into your neur neurons. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to hardwire. It's not just a passing that felt good. Okay, so it takes practice. Everything we do, whether I'm learning the computer or learning music to play the piano, whatever, it takes practice. This is not a, a quick fix. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it takes practice every day of saying, oh my gosh, my dog just rubbed up against me and, and gave me the most wonderful look, soulful look. I can skip by that and take it for granted, or I can bring it in and say, wow, that really picked me up. That felt so good. And that's hardwiring. 
So and then you can also create um, enjoyable experiences in your brain. You can bring back a memory. It can be from high school of, of getting a fabulous grade on something or uh, going to a friend's wedding or your grandchild hugging you or saying, I love you. Those are all um, experiences we don't have to go out and make. We've got them all here. We've got memories that we can call on. And again, if we bring that memory up, the important thing is not bringing it up so much, but bringing it in. feeling it. That's what's bringing it into yourself. And that's what's going to hardwire it and create the neurons that are positive. So they're going to counterbalance that negative bias we have that we want to go to right away. Oh, I got that fight or flight. It's like a default on your computer. You know, if you have the default set for a certain type um, and you're getting tired of it, you change the default and that's all you're doing with your brain. With a little practice, you change the default so that you're going more to the positive. And uh, what that does is it shoots out wonderful hormones, serotonin, dopamine. Um, again, if we had a lot of time, we could talk about the hormone and the physiological effect of some of these exercises. Uh, and maybe we'll do a continuing um, saga on this. Um, so I'm seeing we've got, I'm trying to be mindful of the time. We've got uh, about 45 minutes here. So um, what I'd like to do is We've done, we've done the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And if you, can, if you can remember this, just about that one piece, the sympathetic is a reactive response. It's a knee-jerk response. Sometimes that's not very helpful, especially in a conversation with somebody. Somebody's gotten you really riled up or annoyed or is is uh, triggering something in you. So we can go into that knee-jerk response, which is our mind saying, oh, I've got to protect here. I'm, go I'm being hurt, I'm being assaulted, whatever, verbally. Um, or we can take a deep breath, which I have to do with some family members and they probably have to do with me. Uh, take a deep breath and create some space around that know that we have choices. Okay, if I want to blast that person, that's my choice, but I'm going to have to probably clean up after the mess. Or do I want to go into the response, relax, and recover? And that may mean saying, I can't talk about that right now. That's self-compassion. That's saying, I need to protect myself right now. Um, or give me a couple of hours and I'll come back to this. That's what our, sympath our parasympathetic response can help us with. And again, if we go into reactive response, don't forget all those hormones that aren't so great for us, cortisol is going to start shooting off big time. Cortisol is going to say, okay, you're in fight or flight. We need to do all of this. Your heart's going to speed up your heart rate. Your um, blood pressure is going to go up. You know, those are all things that don't need to happen. So um, I, think, I think we covered it uh, pretty well. Um, but the difference between feeling capable and confident and handling challenge, a challenging situa situation or feeling worried, rattled, and hopeless is actually our choice more than we realize, or more than many of us have realized. 
where does hopelessness come from? A lot of us may have felt that during this pandemic or during losing somebody or just being having an illness yourself. There can be a feeling of hopelessness of I'm never going to get out of this. That's that negative feedback loop happening. Um, so right away, again, if we can be mindful of our thoughts, because every thought is a seed, it plants something that's going to grow. Every thought is a seed. If you look at it energetically, every emotion has an energy, every thought has an energy. And it's what do I want my energy system to be comprised of? Um, so just knowing that if you're feeling hopeless or rattled or worried, what are my resources? What are my resources here? My internal resources? What are my external resources? So again, we've touched on some of those, touching base with a friend, getting out into nature. Music, who can listen to music and at the same time have a problem? Think of your music. I would love anybody to share their favorite music right now. If I listen to Tina Turner singing Big Wheels Keep On Turning, are you kidding me? I cannot have a negative thought in my mind. I see some smiles. <laughs> I see some smiles. So that's something you can refer to. Put on some good music or even bring it to mind. That's that positive piece. And a music, music goes on for a couple minutes. So you've just given yourself a couple minutes of rest and relax. Think of it that way. So I love this quote, adversity is an opportunity to, to develop resilience, even post-traumatic growth. And I can't go into that now because of time, but um, there is something called post-traumatic growth. And I think we're actually all going through it. Um, we've been through trauma for two and a half years. We've been on high alert for two and a half years, probably in, in reactive mode for two and a half years. And you think about, you know, what has that done to my system? Do I deserve to um, be more responsive instead of reactive? And how can I do that now? We're hearing news now about, you know, we've reached the peak, we're almost there. And and some commentators are saying, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not the train coming down the tracks. There's a real light at the end of the tunnel. So again, can we focus on even the smallest positive things that are happening? Because when we do, we're gonna attract more of that. We're gonna attract more of that. And we're gonna say, actually, I don't want to listen to the person who's saying there's a new conspiracy theory out there. Is that what I want to feed myself? Is that energy what I want to bring in? Or could I say thanks, but no thanks? I have a friend who, uh, when we start talking, we go for a walk, and when somebody brings up COVID, she'll say, could we have a COVID-free zone here? And I love that. It can be any kind of a free zone. Can we have a political free zone? <laughs> and just let me enjoy the walk or let me enjoy your company right now. Tell me something good. <laughs> and that's not, that's not being uh, fake. It's not being, it's just saying, I'm taking care of me right now. And that's how I do it. Um, so group sharing can be a very powerful resource um, and any kind of group, a support group, um, a therapy group. Um, and I, I just want to touch on one thing because as much as we develop our resilience, I don't want to uh, skip saying that we can get overloaded. 
we can get in overwhelm. There can be situations that it, like a tsunami just keep coming and coming and coming until our resilience says, I can't do this. And if that happens, be your own best friend and get the right support that you need in that moment, be it a therapist, um, a guide, a trusted guide, but don't ever feel you have to do it yourself. I wanna make, make that a very big point, okay? As much as we, we can develop this resilience, part of it, part of it, our resilience is the awareness of when it's over the top for us. So, um, Let's see. So, you know, I think one of the big things is that these are durable strengths that we're developing. This isn't something that is going to be with me today and it's not going to be there tomorrow. If I practice this, whether it's through yoga and settling my mind or meditation or mindfulness or uh, being out in nature can be just as meditative as sitting on your cushion at home. Uh, listening to music can be a meditation, art can be a meditation, all of it. There's no one de definition of meditation. Um, but I think also for all of us, for each of us, recognizing what we've been through and being able to say, oh my gosh, I got through it. I'm not quite at the end of it. And something else will will come in, we know that. We've been through wars, we've been through pandemics before in this history of our world. Something's gonna come in again, but if we've got that base of resilience, that rock, we're not gonna be blown over. Um, it's like the, the willow tree that doesn't have very, very deep roots. It's the first one to go over. So our roots, whatever grounds us. So I'd like to do a grounding exercise. Does everybody know what grounding is, everybody? Grounding, uh, it's what my mother used to say when I was a teenager, you're grounded. And you probably have heard that or you've said it. You are grounded, young lady. You are not going out of the house for a week. Now, when somebody says you're grounded, it's a compliment because I can very easily go out of my body when I get worried or frightened or whatever. So this is a very big practice for me to stay grounded. So one, the first grounding is, is breath. That's a ground. It's when you latch on to that parasympathetic in the vagal nerve. When you, when you say to the parasympathetic, I need you. You're here for me. So that's one part of grounding. Another part of grounding is putting your hand on your heart and taking a deep breath and asking yourself, what do I need right now? For any of you who are skiers, I'm gonna see if I can do this. No, I probably can't. But for any of you who are skiers, um, when you hunch down, get down low, and you turn your knees and your feet in a little bit and you get into like a, you know how you've seen anybody skiing, racing? They get down into that hunch position. That's what we wanna do. Bending your knees and hanging over your body is one of the most grounding things you can do. It brings you right back to earth. So, um, grounding, that's another thing you can do to ground. And um, figure eights, you can ground that way. You can ground with your very thoughts. Does anybody have um, little sayings up around the house or affirmations? That's a way of grounding. Remembering, there's a term called remembered wellness. And remembering how it feels like when I am grounded and knowing what it feels like when I'm not. 
So those are a few things. And yeah, recognizing what we've come through and appreciating yourself, good Lord. Could you list on two hands what you've had to do for other people, for yourself getting through this? It's, um, it's pretty miraculous when you think about it, coming up with new ways of doing things, being there for other people, being there for yourself. So that's, that's it. Um, so I, I just want to add that most people experience the responsive mode many times a day, but they also often blow right by it. So I could get a jarring phone call, and while I'm on that phone call, uh, automatically I could start my breathing, which is something that's getting a little more automatic for me, thank goodness. So I'm on that phone call, and somebody's going, blah, 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 you did this, you did that, blah, 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 triggering all the things that I used to think about myself. Yeah, you're really no good. Yeah, you're blah, blah, blah. So if I am going into my breathing, I'm automatically doing that. So pay attention to when you are using some of these tools, okay? And um, like we were saying, the more we use them, the expression is what gets fired gets wired. <laughs> so what gets fired off in you it's wired in you. So if it's positive stuff, that'll get wired. If it's uh, negative, blah, 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 that'll get wired too. So what do we want to take in? It's like, a, like we have a screen and that screen can make sure we don't take anything in that we don't want to, that we don't give permission to, shall I say. Um, so hardwiring is staying with positive things, positive experiences for more than a few seconds, feeling them. And I think that's, that's going to pretty much bring us to a place of where I'd like to ask if there are any questions. Um, Anything you'd like to add about your own resilience, your own experience? Um, if you want to share something tough you've gotten through and how you got through it, whatever. This is a this is a good time to kind of wrap up. Um, and I'd love to answer if I can any questions. If I can't, I might be able to direct you to someone who can. So. I open the floor. I think you have a, a button you can push that raises a hand or just speak out. There are a few of us en enough that we could probably just speak out. Guy, could you repeat the quote about adversity? Adversity is an opportunity. Adversity is an opportunity. That's a funny paradox in itself, to develop resilience and even post-traumatic growth. So you know when they talk about the yin and the yang, without darkness we wouldn't know what light is. Um, it's that kind of thing. Adversity maybe you look at as the darkness, but and maybe this is the silver lining. This pandemic for all of us has changed the way we relate to ourselves, maybe to other people, maybe to our community. Um, I, for one, am so appreciating what the library does. Uh, you know, I've probably taken it for granted. I'm sorry, Ann. Um, but I am now realizing how this library has connected us today uh, it connects us every day uh, through chess groups. There's a book group. Um, there are, there's an art project group where you can come and pick up a, a package that you can do art with your kids. 
Um, I, I've only touched on a few of them, but so that's where adversity, the silver lining of adversity is opening it up and seeing it as an opportunity to change. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's like the dark night of the soul, but dark night of the soul. Yeah, exactly. Jim, can you chime in? Uh, in keeping what you're discussing uh, and resilience, have you ever heard the term grit as applied to sociology and psychology? Say it again. What's the term? Grit. 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 Yes, grit. totally. Right, grit. Yeah. Totally, it's a so wonderful. How do you, do you see the relationship there with what you're talking about with, with that idea? Yes, it's a wonderful term. Grit and uh, strength, it's grit being just amazing strength, true grit, right? Yeah, fortitude. Uh, it means sticking to it, staying sticking with it. Sticking to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, what for you brings true grit or has brought you true grit? I don't really know about that, but I, I, it seems quite logical to me uh, that one must stick to what they're doing. Uh, and in talking about succeeding or not succeeding, I think we all have problems with that. But I think if you aspire to something, you're lucky if you're close to 10% or a little more in the long run. Uh, and I think it's very necessary that we all accept that. We can't have everything. Nothing is that perfect. So we have no. to settle for certain yes. things along the way while, while proceeding with an idea of resilience or grit. Yeah, I think that's well put. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a John Cabot Zinn again is one of my favorites. Um, and he wrote a book called Wherever You Go, There You Are meaning we can't get away from ourselves. <laughs> Even if we travel to the ends of the earth, we're still there. And what we're dealing with is still there. And I think this speaks to what you were just saying, Jim. Um, he has a saying, uh, instead of wishing things were different than they are, let's apply a skillful, skillful means to dealing with what is. And that helps me a lot. Um, trying to be skillful for what's actually happening. And that's, that's a piece of acceptance. Uh, acceptance doesn't mean just blindly saying, oh, this is okay. Acceptance is saying, this is actually what's happening. Somebody I love is, is ill or my son's not talking to me, or, or um, yeah, I need to put some more money in my savings account. It doesn't look great, whatever. That's the reality and the acceptance. And then beyond that is what can I do about it? And, and maybe there's nothing, but maybe there are things, um, problem solving with people. Um, with a close, trusted friend. Um, so yeah, there is the acceptance. This is the reality of what I'm going through right now. And if I try to run from it, it's not going to disappear. But if I try to look at it, and Pema Chodron, who is a wonderful Buddhist teacher, says, and she uses the expression leaning into it. When I lean into it, it's like the boogeyman disappears. I have, I have met it head on. I, I think that's what true grit can do for us. Um, anybody else? Any questions? Any? Um, I think we're good. So I want to. I want to say thank you all for giving up an hour and a half of your time on a freezing cold Saturday. I don't know what else we would be doing, but it's great that we could meet together like this. And um, I just, I honor what each person is going through, has gone through. Um, 
we can't walk in each other's footsteps, but we can honor no matter what it is that somebody's feeling. We don't want to cover it up by saying, oh, it'll go away, it'll be fine tomorrow. Just listening and honoring that and doing the same for ourselves. No, I, I was one who was brought up to pull myself up, up by my bootstraps. Has anybody heard that horrible expression? <laughs> oh, you'll be fine. Other people have it worse, you know, blah, 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 blah. What are you complaining about? How about I'll give you something to complain about? And all of those expressions, right? Instead of just honoring what that person might be feeling, we don't have to fix it. None of us need fixing, by the way. We need encouragement. We need a good listener, maybe a good therapist, maybe a, a guide, maybe a trusted friend. But we don't need fixing. We just need to keep learning about ourselves and honoring all the good that we have. So... I just want to say also in closing that as we do this individual work, uh, resilience has been looked at as individual, interrelational. So myself to my partner, myself to my child, my grandchild, whatever, uh, my coworker, interrelational. It has been looked at as individual, interrelational, community based and global. So we know now scientifically that uh, if I work on me and become more resilient or more caring or kind, that has a ripple effect to my partner. And then that goes out into the community and has a ripple effect and that community has a ripple effect on the CEO of an organization, listening more to people's problems, to injustices. It has a ripple effect in politics, let's hope. Um, and it has a ripple effect then around the globe because we're a global community now. We know this better than ever. This pandemic has affected every person with suffering and loss and so many things on so many levels. And, you know, what comes to mind, do you remember the, the newscast of the people singing to each other? I think it was in Spain. They were out on balconies. Does anybody remember that? They were on balconies singing to each other across the street. And I looked at that and I, oh, I think I was crying. It was like, oh my God, people who may not even have said hello to each other on the street for 15 years are singing to each other. So let's sing to each other, however we do it. Let's sing to each other. Let's bring each other uh, resilience in a package by starting with ourselves. Um, so learn more about the body. I encourage each of us to learn more about the body-mind connection um, and the durable strengths that we can count on when we're hardwired. It's not such a hard thing to do, but maybe it requires a little discipline to put it into practice. Um, so, and finally, decide if there's anything you want to do differently almost on the other side of this. So I'd love any feedback as we close out here on anything you would like to do differently. It can be anything from more exercise to eating better uh, to, oh, I wanna bring this in. I did this artwork for you. You won't be able to see it, but it's, just letting us know visually that resilience is a whole combination of things. It's mental, it's emotional, it's spiritual, and it's physical, and they all overlap. And in the middle, 
is congruence or balance. So we might not be able to have all of these operating at the same time in balance, but if we can get just a piece of one of them and improve on it, enlarge it a little bit, it's going to affect every other one. So think of, think of your resilience as a committee and how much more a committee can get done sometimes than an individual. So you've got all these pieces. I tried to show that they were kind of overlapping, but not being a wonderful artist, I'm not sure I quite got that, but um, so I think probably the most important piece on this is deep listening to ourselves and our hearts and connecting with something greater than ourselves and making meaningful connections in our lives. Meaningful connections and maybe for me, um, doing a better job of, of um, making those connections, uh, of putting those into action, uh, whether it's writing my granddaughter some more letters and letting her know um, how much I love her in writing instead of just FaceTiming, uh, little things like that. So again, I'm putting it out there. We've got about 10 minutes and I would love it if you would, if you have any sharing on what you'd like to see differently. And I don't want to get into a political discussion here. You can touch on that, but uh, what you'd like to see personally for yourself, Any anything? Yes, if I may talk, um, thank you for this amazing presentation. Um, I'm sorry about my voice. I have COVID, but at least I got, because of Anne putting it on Zoom, I get to watch it. So thank you both, uh, <laughs> Ms. Derlin so and Anne. So much love to you and, and healing vibes. Let's all send those. <laughs> Thank so you. I appreciate, yeah. it. I appreciate it. I will. What I want to change. I have two littles. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, yes, my six-year-old. Yes, my six-year-old uh, straight drains me a lot. So instead of like when I get frustrated, I'll say, "I have to." I'm gonna change um, with that piece of gratitude you mentioned. I get to. I get to enjoy his naughtiness at six. <laughs> oh my gosh. You've just been a big um, a, a big piece of proving resiliency. I mean, you could have said, I don't have time for this, or I'm going to lie here and feel sorry for myself. You've done, you haven't done that, obviously. You're focused on your healing, your learning, and being with other people who might be supportive. So Lots and lots of love and good healing vibes to you. Thank you. Yeah. I just, I want to say thank you to anybody who has contributed verbally and to all of you who have contributed by being such amazing listeners. And um, I think if we can, if we can keep on feeling what this group support does. And group support doesn't have to be a bunch of people. It can be two people going out for a walk together. Or, um, you know, I, a couple of years ago when I was feeling really down and feeling very alone for some reason, it was just a time of my life for going through that. I decided I needed to, to do something proactive. So I went and I started working at a soup kitchen in New London. And I thought I was gonna be helping other people or contributing to the community in that way. What I was surprised to find is that I was probably receiving more than I was giving. Um, 
And there is, there's some wonderful scientific research on that, that where they've done the giver and the receiver, and then they've had people behind a, a, a window, a darkened window, so the giver and the receiver don't know that they're being observed. And when they've done the, the MRIs, um, the brain scanning, what they have found time and time again is that the giver is having these, this beautiful hormone bath of dopamine and serotonin. The receiver is having a beautiful hormone bath of serotonin and dopamine and some of the other wonderful happy hormones. And the amazing thing is that the people observing are receiving maybe not quite as much, but they're still receiving a hormone bath of these positive hormones. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? That just your smile, <laughs> just your phone call, just your interaction, even through your eyes. Sometimes I've noticed I can see people smiling, even though they've got a mask on. Have you ever noticed that? You can see them smiling. And so knowing that every action we put out there has a reaction to somebody and vice versa from those people to us. So I guess that's it. We have wrapped it up and just kudos, deep bows to all of you and, and deep bows to you for making this happen, for bringing us together and um, my one last word. Oh, I hope it's not my last, but no. for today, my, my last word is don't forget gratitude. That's a part of this uh, resilience. Uh, gratitude. It's the same thing. When we say thank you, we're creating very positive hormones. Uh, we're deepening our resilience. We're They've even found that gratitude improved your immune system. How nice is that? So being gra gracious, gratitude, saying thank you, showing somebody, receiving thanks. I'm not so good at receiving. My dear, dear friends that I walk with have, are teaching me how to receive more graciously. It's not so easy. But um, I... I feel it. I'm allowing myself to receive and say thank you instead of, oh, that's okay. I don't need that. I don't need anything. I'm just fine. I think all of us could probably raise a hand to, been there, done that. So um, my, last, <laughs> my last thought is be grateful for what we've got, even the smell of coffee, the beautiful dog or cat looking at us, the phone call, being able to wear clean clothes. Let's be grateful for all of it. Keep bows to each of you. Thank you.